couple of weeks ago, I was at a retreat sponsored by our bishop, and we had a guest speaker by the name of Kabamba Kiboko, who is from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And she told us her story of coming to the United States to study biblical interpretation. And when she first arrived in the United States, she had to learn English. This was her 11th language. So she knew something about how to learn a language. And she decided that since she only had a couple of months since the master's program started, before it started, that she really needed an intensive course. So she decided to work at a children's camp because she felt like working with children would really help her get the language. So she was working at this children's camp, and one day the camp director asked her to get the hot dogs out of the freezer for the children's lunch. Now, she was very confused about this. First of all, she had no idea how dogs could be hot in the freezer. And second of all, she hadn't realized that that was a food that they would be serving the children. So she looked, and she didn't find anything. She was just very confused by the whole thing. And the camp director came and shared with her that these are hot dogs, took out this little plastic package. So you can understand how someone learning English, that phrase hot dog would be very confusing. She went on to earn a doctorate in biblical interpretation. And she became an expert in the Hebrew Bible and in reading the Hebrew Bible in Hebrew and in its original language. And she said at our conference that reading the Bible is a lot like her experience of trying to find hot dogs in a freezer. That there's a lot gets lost in translation. And she did kind of a whole thing around how much we lose in translation and how much we don't even realize that we lose in translation. So one might wonder then, why are we reading and how are we getting meaning out of a book that was written 2,000 years ago in a culture completely different than ours? Can you imagine how much we're losing in translation? And we think particularly about the Gospels where we're getting the story of Jesus and we can kind of follow a lot of that. But the Revelation is just, a lot of us, I think, just set Revelation aside. It's very mysterious, if not downright scary. I mean, there are beasts, there are dragons. There's this 144,000, what in the world is that? How is it that there is so much power to break every chain in these 2,000-year-old scriptures. What miracle transcends the cultural millennial gap that helps to bring incredible power? This 13th chapter of Revelation describes our reality as well as any text in available to any of us. This text goes in in ways that we don't often go in. It breaks through the mythology. It breaks through the chains of ignorance. It breaks through the uh, propaganda and exposes what is for what it is. And that then helps us to see what can be. It is only by seeing what is that we can begin to see what can be. If we're deluded by what is and thinking what is is all there is, we can't see what can be. And so by introducing us to the beast, we can see the lamb. Now the interpretive bridge that we need to move across these 2,000 years back into this mysterious text is to understand that John, a prisoner on Patmos, is describing the Roman Empire. The beast is the empire. He even gives it a specific name, 666, which most scholars believe is the numerical name for Nero. So we're talking particularly about the Roman Empire between the year 54 and 68. This is a very specific description of a people under siege, a people who are being prosecuted, persecuted, crucified, but yet need to speak truth in ways that we can't even speak about our own empire. There's a depth of going in that takes us to a place. So the beast 
is the empire. The beast is the Roman empire. Actually, I have cut a lot of verses out of this because it's very long and it's hard to follow. But you can read through the whole of 13th chapter. But there are actually two beasts. There's one beast that rises out of the sea that then hands its power over to the second beast, who it seems is Nero in particular or the empire under Nero. And there are specific characteristics of the beast that I think are helpful. The beast is haughty. The beast is blasphemous. The beast is deceptive. The beast speaks with arrogance. The beast has no respect for human beings, for human culture. The beast is haughty. The beast is arrogant. The beast is deceptive. What we're hearing is not necessarily truth. And I know we know that in our heads, but sometimes we forget. Sometimes we normalize that which is not normal. Sometimes we go in and receive things that are just not so. Should we name our own empire the beast? What help would it give for us to begin to look at something that is not uh, just rational? To go in beyond something that is not just as it seems on the surface, but to really begin to look at what's beneath the surface. You know, there are so many stories, I don't know even where to begin. But what if we started with the story of Dr. Larry Nasser? Fifteen-year-old Megan Halicek fractured her spine on the U.S. gymnastics team, went to Dr. Nasser, and this is her quote as she has given testimony in court this week. Again and again and again, he abused me, all the while telling me stories about his Olympic journey. I closed my eyes. I held my breath. I wanted to puke. To this day, those feelings are there. To this day, those feelings are there. This is what, this is Megan Halicek's experience of democracy, liberty, and justice for all. This is her physical, visceral experience. This is the experience of over 150 women, 150 women, as young as age 6, age 9, Age 12, 14, on the University of or the Michigan State sports teams and the U.S. gymnastics team over a period of 20 years. Now, we can, I mean, this guy, you know, what in the world is going on in this man's head? We can, we can get that. He's going to go to jail probably for the rest of his life. This has come out, and he's going. But you've got to ask other questions. You've got to ask, how does this guy maintain himself as the doctor for the U.S. gymnastics team and Michigan State University over a period of 20 years, abusing 150 or more women that have come forward. At least 14 staff members at the Michigan State knew about this. It had been reported. You think about how does Megan, at 15 years old, you know, they're told by their coach to go see this doctor. They have no choice. This is, there's no uh, choice for them any, anywhere in this. And even with this power differential, they reported it. They report this is not right. They reported it, reported it, 14 staff members at Michigan State, including the president of the university. Now, this is not the only state university that's gone through this. A few years ago, it was Penn State University. Now it's Michigan State University. What's going on at Iowa State and Oklahoma State and Ohio State? You know, because in this country, business trumps rights. Business trumps humanity. Sports is big business. And it's what's, it's what's for dinner. You know, the old commercial about out in, what was it, Kansas or somewhere? Beef's what's for dinner. You don't think about what's in it. You don't think about it. It's just what's for dinner. Sports is what's for dinner. I was doing my physical therapy this week and just listening to the conversation all around. Everybody's gearing up for the sports. What is it? The Super Bowl's coming up. 
And some of these people didn't even know what football was, but it's, they ha- knew what team they liked and what team they didn't like because it was for dinner. It's, it's what's there. And oftentimes we can't see what's actually happening because we're so captured by the propaganda, the mythology. Even those of us who are woke, you know, it, this stuff is the water we drink. It's the air we breathe. It's so deep inside us, we don't even see it. And so John talks about the beast. Becky and I had an experience of the beast on Martin Luther King Day where this Nasser guy goes for 20 years abusing young girls and young women. There's a whole bunch of young people out here on the streets of the Bronx that can get taken to jail just like that for doing nothing or for doing the most minor infraction. 80% of the people at Rikers Island haven't even been convicted of a crime. And they can be there for months and years awaiting trial. And so we saw the movie Rikers, an American jail, told in that way because this is, you know, it's extreme. The movie's extreme. You feel like you're just nauseous watching the movie. But this is American jail. We have the highest population of people incarcerated in the world, in human history, young people, and the violence that they go through from the moment they walk in the gate, convicted or not, guilty or not, having done anything or not, doesn't matter. And one of the people that was interviewed is a guy named uh, Benny Castudio, who used to be a part of New Day Church, and preached here when he first got out of jail after some 20 years. Um, And he talked about the experience of being marked, that you get marked. You give up your name for a number, and he would recite his number that had to do with the date he was arrested and where and all that. And that becomes your identity. You are marked by the beast. And one of the people on the panel invited us to do an exercise. He said, just close your eyes, and I'm going to invite us to do it as well. Just close your eyes and imagine the worst thing you've ever done, the thing that you're most ashamed about doing, and all of us got it. And if there was ever a movie of my 100 most embarrassing moments and and really sad moments, I'd just be mortified. Think of that moment, that thing that just sticks out that you most, or the most horrible thing you've ever been accused of doing. Maybe that you never actually did, but that you were accused of doing. Now, write that on a sticky note. Imagine yourself writing that and put it on your forehead and then it becomes emblazoned there forever, wherever that is you. Okay, you can open your eyes. Then he says that's the experience of being in jail. You are for the rest of your life known by that. You can come out of you. You can serve 22 years. You can come out. You try to get a job. The first thing they want to know is, have you ever been convicted of a felony? If you have, tell me all about it. Every time you go to a job interview, every time you try to find housing, every time you try to move about, even after having served that time, the mark. What are the ways that we're marked by the beast? In Revelation 13, the beast marks on the forehead or on the the hand, and you can't get a job, you can't buy anything or sell anything, you can't find housing without people seeing the mark of the beast. How are we marked? What are the different ways? that we're marked. We're marked in a consumer society as as consumers. You're marked as a consumer. Becky and I have been looking for tickets to a trip that we want to take this summer. And now we haven't even bought the tickets yet, but it keeps showing up on both of our, you know, I bought that phone. I bought that phone. It's my phone. But this society thinks that it can use what I bought to tell me what I need to do. And these things keep popping up. Do this. Buy this. Do you want to do this? I didn't ask for this. But you're marked. 
People are watching you. They know where you are. They got your location. They know what you're doing. You're marked by the beast. If in the empire we can be marked as veterans, bar marked by military service, and we can be uh, lose our freedom and be sent to wherever uh, we have to be sent, and we see what empire does in Honduras. I mean, somebody got elected. Where? What happened to democracy and liberty and justice and all these things that we say we stand for? A guy gets elected. Salvador gets elected in, in Honduras, and, and uh, Hernandez doesn't want to leave. So Trump sends him an uh, envelope full of millions of dollars to give him some support. And people are being killed on the streets. People standing up for democracy and liberty and justice being shot down on the streets. The beast marks us. But these are not the only marks available to us. Once we can see what it is that we're actually dealing with, then we can also look across the valley to the mountaintop and realize that there's an alternative, that the beast is not the only one in the business of offering identity, that there is the lamb. And in contrast to the beast, Jesus is presented as the Lamb. And, of course, this has imagery around the sacrificial lamb. It has to do with the crucifixion. It has to do with the martyrdom. And he's there with the 144,000. Who are the 144,000? And, you know, we some churches get literal about this stuff, and you miss the whole point. Oh, only 144,000 are going to heaven. No, that's not the point. The point is, that 144,000 is a number of completeness. It's 12 times 12,000. It's actually explained in the text that each of the 12 tribes, the nation of Israel is made up of 12 tribes. That's why there are 12 disciples, even though there were actually a whole bunch more disciples. You know, it's all symbolic. So 12 times 12,000, 144,000, this is the number of completeness. These are the people who are rising up. There is power in the name of Jesus. If we can name the reality of what we're living with, then we can also see the reality of what's available to us. There is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain. And we look across at the Lamb, and we see that there also are a people rising up. There's a people rising up who are no longer willing to live in this beastly condition who have seen and who have named the beast for what it is, who have uh, rejected the marking of the beast, who have rejected the marking on the forehead and on the hand that the beast says, and they are marked by the lamb because the lamb also marks. And what does the lamb mark? Redeemed. Redeemed. Take that piece of paper and tear it up. Throw it away. Put it in the fire. You are redeemed. You are not marked by what you have done, what you're guilty about, what other people have accused you of, the names that other people want to call you, the categories that other people want to put you in, the limitations that other people want to put around you, the chains that other people want to put on your arms and your legs. You are not bound. You are not only limited to that because there is another namer, your creator, who knows who you are who knows who you are, knows what you're called to do, knows who you're called to be, much better than the beast. The beast is blasphemous. The beast is a deceiver. The lamb is a truth teller. People worship the beast because they think it has a power. Who can fight against the beast? How mighty is the beast? Who's going to go over to the army of the lamb? What is the lamb up against the beast? How can a lamb possibly stand against the beast? So we're going to go with the power of the beast rather than the lamb. But the lamb is victorious. And the 144,000 that are rising up are victorious over the millions that have signed on with the beast. And you're invited. And the 144,000 can become 344,000. And a, a 1.4 million, it can become more and more. We're all invited to come over to the side of the beast. I was talking to a pastor friend of mine this week, and I was talking, I asked him, what, what was your call about? Tell me your call story. And he said, well, I lived many, many years cynical, bitter, angry. That's one direction you can go. 
because the beast will turn you that way. If you can name the beast, I mean, even under the beast, basically we have a couple of options. Either we can live utterly deceived and buy everything and just kind of try to go for that, or we can get real cynical because who can fight against the beast? What you going to do? You just kind of so I'm just going to look out for me. And he was saying that's basically, you know, he said I did a stint in the army, said I did, you know, I worked here, and I did this and that. I was in and out of church, but I was just, you know, cynical. He said, and then I got redeemed. That was the change. He said, I got redeemed. I realized, first of all, that I have these same kind of characteristics in me, that it's not just them. It can also be me. But that I'm loved. That I got that I'm loved. I got that I'm worthy. Some people told it to me. Some people put some trust in me. I opened and received the lamb, and I became one of the 144,000. This is something that's available to us. It takes courage to acknowledge what is, because sometimes what is is scary. It takes courage sometimes to go to the doctor because we'd rather not know. It takes courage sometimes to speak truth to one another because sometimes we'd rather live in a superficial getting along okay than really entering into the fullness of the relationship that God is calling us to have. This Me Too thing is just scratching the surface. This is just the beginning. You know, half the population has been living with a whole lot of stuff for a whole lot of centuries. And the lid is getting moved off of this thing, and I don't think it's going to stop anytime soon. There's a whole lot more to explore. Are we up for it? Are we courageous enough to believe that we don't have to live with lukewarm? We don't have to live with halfway? We don't have to live with sort of good? We don't have to live with just kind of surviving? That God is actually inviting us to be among the 144,000. God is inviting us to be a part of a people rising up. That we have gifts, we have graces, we have forgiveness. There is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain. There is a people rising up. We're going to do communion a little differently this morning. We're going to do a Revelations 14 communion. We're going to allow the lamb and the 144,000 to be part of the invitation, the, the bread and the cup to be part of the redemption, the, vi the visceral actual experience of receiving the cup and the bread. These are gifts that God has given to you. They don't seem like much, just as the lamb doesn't seem like much against the beast. What is a little piece of bread? But when we open ourselves to the power of the Spirit, we realize, and it's not something anybody can prove to you, it's something you already know in your heart. There is power. In the name of Jesus, there is grace, there is mercy. I am, you are, we are redeemed. Amen.